Welcome back to Cocktails and Classics. This week we watched The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. In today's episode, we have myself, Cameron, Zach, Carlos, and Ben. To kick this thing off and get everybody in the right mood, I'm going to pass it over to Carlitos, our makeshift bartender for this week's Inspired Cocktail. Thank you to everyone else for tuning in for another episode. We have another cocktail this week, and this is the good, the bad, and the ugly. This cocktail comes to us from the Educated Barfly, and here's what you're going to need for this week's cocktail. You're going to need two ounces of gin, 0.75 ounces of lemon juice, 0.5 ounces of orgo, or orgeo, however you pronounce it, one whole kiwi, six small mint leaves, or you could use four of regular size, egg white, top soda water, and mint sprig garnish and a lemon twist. So it's a little bit complicated, but I think it has some great tasting notes. Uh, so check out the recipe in the show notes. Boys, what'd you think of it? Hold on, hold on one second. I just want to get this one on the record. Orgette. Ah, oh, it is Orgette. Is it orgette. Orgette. really? Orgette. I feel like the French would have dropped that T completely. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? Maybe it's not There's French. There's no X in there, so it can't be Joe. Well, that's just slutty Joe. It's like when it's like when uh, names end in I's here, like Brandy or Carly, but with an I. Mm. Or Sydney. With an I, yeah. Oh. <laughs> or, or a Cindy, Y. Yeah. Why is or, it <laughs> or Cindy, but it's misspelled. Cindy, yeah. Uh, this one, it, I will agree with Carlos. It's a little difficult to make. It takes a little time. You you have to double strain it. And oh my God, when you shake kiwi, does it become basically just like snot? And it <laughs> is so hard to filter liquid through that. Uh, You're really making but I this think sound it's a, appealing to the listeners. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but I do think it tastes it tastes really, it, it's nice. Um, you can really taste the uh, orgette. Uh <laughs> And, uh, yeah, you get that, like, little almond, the mint, a um, little bit of the lemon, the gin. You know, it just kind of, like, all the ingredients, it's really well balanced. Um, and it's a little sweet because I use Sprite instead of uh, soda water because I'm a basic bitch. And uh, I don't really like carbonated things that don't have sugar in them. But I would recommend it. Take time, craft yourself a little nice cocktail, and uh, enjoy the film with it. Yeah, much much like this movie, the process to make this drink, it's long, but it's very worth it. Yeah, it's uh, there. It is <laughs> as the. Uh, God damn it. If you decide to make yourself a good, bad, and the ugly cocktail, send us a picture on Instagram at Cocktails and Classics Pod and use hashtag Cocktails and Classics. We love to see how you're good bad and the ugly cocktail came out again check out the educated bar flies link in the show notes <clears throat> if you have not seen the movie the good the bad and the ugly sit back sip on next week's cocktail grab your six shooter and enjoy the show there will be spoilers from here on out otherwise continue on for our post movie discussion this week we watched the good the bad and the ugly a 1966 film from sergio leone um Released in Italy in 1966 and then released in America in 1967. The movie stars Clint Eastwood, Eli Wallach, and Lee Van Cleef. Music by the late Ennio Morricone. So the movie has an 8.8 out of 10 currently on IMDb. Uh, it's number nine on the top 250 of uh, top rated movies. And it wasn't nominated for a single Oscar at the time, which is kind of surprising thinking of like how highly regarded this movie is now. Uh, so yeah, it surprised me a little bit. Uh, apparently people didn't like spaghetti Westerns and they thought they were shit. So they actually gave them like garbage reviews back in the day. I mean, well, they also didn't trust the Italian directors. Well, that's why Westerns. they're called spaghetti Westerns is because of the, <laughs> that's why they have a, a <laughs> semi racist. Right. Name. Yeah. Definitely a derogatory yeah. term. I think, I think a lot of Western movies back in the 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 sixties and that were kind of viewed the way comic book movies are viewed now, 
where even if someone gives a great performance, it doesn't matter because it's like a summer blockbuster type movie. It's not going to get nominated for awards unless it's well, dark and, unless it's dark and edgy. But I mean, I mean, they get like VFX awards and stuff like that. But yeah, I, yeah. I know what you mean. Like, not they're not going to get like best picture noms or like best or actor best noms. Act- exactly. Yeah, I think that's just kind of the way. I think Oscar bait movies have existed since then. Oh yeah, I'll oh, say yeah. it. Yeah. Looking at you, Sylvester Stallone, and Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cameron, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on the good, the bad, and the ugly? I thought it was all right. Um, it was super long. That was my main criticism. Yeah, two of hours it. and fifty eight minutes, God. and so much happens. It is such a wild ride. I feel like because it, well, yeah, I feel like they vi- they do a lot of like they go to a lot of different places, and so much weird stuff happens. Like. You're introduced to, like, the characters, and they start separate, but then two of them come together for, like, the majority of the movie, and then the bad is, like, I guess the bad guy, but then he also is in, like, the union or something. I don't know if he, like, tricked his way to get in there or what, just to find, like, this thing, but, yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a trick. He was trying to That's get after, thought. uh, he thought that, um, God, what was the guy who they were after? Uh, Carlson, Jack, Bill Jackson, Carson, but he went by Bill yeah, Carson. Carson. He he Bill thought Carson. Bill Carson might be at that POW camp. So yeah, he snuck his way in. Yeah, that's why the uh, the general is is like talking shit to him. He's like, I may be on my deathbed with gangrene in my leg, but I'm hoping to stay alive to bring the evidence. Yeah, to, to you terrible people. Yeah, yeah. This movie is a lot. There's there's multiple like maybe five or six times where there's like an ending it feels like and then Clint Eastwood and uh and Tuco they kind of like turn to the left and then all of a sudden they're like in front of a union army or they're yeah, in front the of a new town <laughs> right how did they not notice that they were held up at gunpoint and they're like oh we didn't see this coming and then they walk like 10 steps and they're like at the union base what the <laughs> fuck like like but the like, captain who's like really obsessed with that bridge. Yeah, it's like God, That's I want to blow that fucking bridge, that stupid sexy yeah. bridge. I want to blow it up right to hell, <laughs> but I won't because I'm a pussy. Like <laughs> like if they broke this movie up into like half hour segments, it could have been like a like one of those mini series. Yeah, TV an hour. Do. This yeah, this in, could be a like, TV show and in hour segments. Like a just a solid. I feel like a solid mini series. Like a, I don't know, you because you could put more you know, more of the detail of like Angel Eyes, you know, disguising his way as a union soldier to get into the POW camp and that. So maybe like a solid four or five episode miniseries, each each episode an hour long, would tell the nice adventure story throughout. Yeah, I had that thought while watching it too. I think it would have been really good. But I think it's good as a long movie. It's just, you know, yeah, you think you're like, okay, we're coming up on the end. Oh, wait a minute. Right, swerve, right. swerve. <laughs> New. I think we're just not used to three-hour movies nowadays. Like The Irishman was like three fifteen or something, three yeah. hours, and everyone like lost their shit. They were like, yeah. "It's so long, I have to do multiple viewings." It, well, this movie it had was so long, I had to do multiple viewings. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the Italian ver- the in the Italian version, this movie has an intermission. I forget which oh, really? scene it's in, but it's about an hour and forty minutes in, and it. I think it's when Tuco is like washing his face with water. It cuts to black, and there's like oh. a 15 minute inter- intermission. And you come back in. Interesting. It's kind of like a play almost. Then. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't want that on like Netflix, obviously, because that doesn't really. Well, oh yeah. wait, there's a an intermission here. <laughs> You're in the middle of your Netflix and chill, and all of a sudden the screen cuts to black. You try to figure out if there's something wrong with your TV or not. <laughs> Guess we better start Perfect chilling time for a quickie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, so also i do feel kind of bad i lied because i have seen some of this movie but not in the normal sense i sent this video to you guys before the show but uh there's a video called the good the bad and the wrecked and it is an mlg compilation of this movie oh my god (laughs) it's so funny like I don't even know how to describe it. Just goes to show you the reach this movie really has. It made it all all the way to an MLG comp. If you if you want to see the good, the bad, and the wrecked, yeah. check the show <laughs> we'll notes. Put it in the show notes. But uh, uh. the scene I just played is 
So how I pick how I like this unlocked a memory in my brain I forgot I had because I saw I saw the the bathtub where he shoots him from the bathtub and I'm like I swear to God I've seen this scene before where have I seen it and then later when Clint Eastwood gives his cigar to that soldier I was like oh my God it's an MLG cop because I remember him putting the cigar in that soldier's mouth and the hit marker noise comes out when he oh, does man. it you guys know where I'm, I'm sure the like man. deal with it sunglasses <laughs> right. fall down on his face or something oh my God and then at the end as you can expect during the last like showdown there's some shit. You guys know where I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly before? That <laughs> shitty YouTube video. <laughs> hey, you fucking, it's a, it's a YouTube video, but it is not shitty. I'm going to rewatch it later after this is over. Was there memorable scenes for anybody? I mean, the stare downs, obviously, I think. Like, at the very, yeah. like, the last, like, the last uh, standoff at the very end of the movie, I feel like, was probably one of the more iconic scenes where they're just, like, staring at each other for literally, like, 20 minutes. Well, okay, maybe not it, 20, but it felt like 20 minutes. It's a long time. I think it's, uh, it's so like the five graveyard minutes. scene beforehand is like four minutes long, and I think the stare down's five minutes long. I think the scene when Blondie goes to shoot and he like he grazes the rope instead of full on <laughs> like shooting it off, and so he's kind of hanging there. The the horse takes off and then he falls especially after they have the argument of, like, I'm the guy who's next in the news. I should be getting paid more. <laughs> he just purposely misses by, like, a fraction of an inch to prove his point. Yeah, also is... the good guy's not that good, by the way. Well, yep. I don't. He's a, I think that's the point. He's a cowboy. He's a renegade, yeah. just like Styx, uh, Styx prophesized. Um, my favorite scene in this movie is actually when Tuco is robbing the gun shop. And uh, it's at the end. At first, he got the gun. I think it's, I think it's right before he takes the hat. He's holding the gun, and he kind of, he's like, "How much?" Oh, yeah. And the store owner's like, "Oh, twenty dollars." Like, "Oh my god, you're actually gonna pay for this thing after you were a complete <laughs> dick to me?" And then Tuco laughs, points the gun at the owner, and says, "No, how much?" Like <laughs> in that <laughs> scene, have. he completely like, flips have, from, yeah. "Oh no, I'm yeah. not buying this." How much are you going to pay me to let you live? Yeah, that that always stuck <laughs> with me. He just puts the clothes sign in the dude's mouth. <laughs> like, ah. yeah, that, that, I did like this scene. That one was clever. I uh, I really enjoyed the the very beginning when we're introduced to the uh, the bad, and he goes up to that guy's house. Yeah, and like the family's everywhere. Also, he just like murked that entire family. Yeah. Oh my god! I'm trying to think of that guy's name. He's named in the movie. I think it's Arthur, and the other guy is Stephen. Like the Which guy in the family? deathbed is Steven. I think the guy eating the like porridge is Arthur. The guy in his deathbed I thought had a name that started with like a B or something. It was like yeah, Baker. Baker. Oh, ba- yeah. Baker or Booker or something Baker. like that. Baker and Stevens, that's what it is. I had him backwards. Baker's on his deathbed. Stevens is the one eating the porridge. Yeah. And he's like he's like, if I get or it's when I'm paid, I always see the job through. Four shots he kills him. Point blank range. <laughs> Takes the thousand yeah, dollars. Well, that'd be great and all, but I got a thousand dollars to kill you. I think. And he's like, oh, ha ha ha. And he's like, unfortunately for you, I see my jobs through and shoots him in the face. Which wasn't even what he was paid to do. The guy was giving him a thousand dollars not to kill him. <laughs> hey, I'll give right. you a thousand dollars not to kill me. Right. Because his I mean, so like his general role then obviously before he like he's with the Union Army is. It's more like a, like a bounty hunter then, right? Or more like a mercenary. Like a mercenary yeah, type? more like a mercenary. Like, okay. Yeah, he's also after just, uh, Bill Clausen's, uh, what is the guy's name? I'm going to forget. Bill Clarson. Bill, Bill, Car- Car- Bill Carson's. Carson's. He's after that gold, so he's just yeah. trying right. to track that down. Right. Yeah, but okay. he's, he's not really after the gold until he, I didn't think he was after the gold until he finds out all the information from Stevens at the beginning. And once he finds out about that, yeah, I mean, I think he's very similar to the to the good, right? I think he's very similar, like him and Clint Eastwood. I feel like are very close together, like in what they want and what they're willing to do to get there. But I think there's just like a fine line between them that separates what they do, essentially. Like they both want to get the money, and they're both willing to kill, obviously. But there's, 
I don't the, think the good at least has a little bit of honor, right? And like, I don't think they're both wanting to kill. I don't I'm think not saying they're wanting to kill. They're I'm willing. Saying that they're willing. They're willing. To. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like they're, they're both to willing do what to it do takes that. to to get that money. Yeah. Even if it means blowing up a good old bridge that the Union right. and the Confederacy <laughs> were just having bridge. a good old duke it out. <laughs> um. And I love for that bridge scene, the guy sees it blow up and just smiles and then dies. It's like, yes, it happened. I love the Union captain's captain's speech where he he talks about, and and we have to get into the ADR, by the way, but the the Union captain's speech of like, it's not about like which side you're on or who you're fighting for. It's about whichever side has more liquor and more guns to send across to the other side. Like, wow. I didn't know we were going to get deep in this movie. Yeah. the uh, I mean, of course, Zach pointed out to me. While I was watching, I texted Zach, and I was like, God, this ADR is terrible. Oh, it was so bad. And, th- <laughs> and then I asked him, I was like, wait, are they speaking a completely different language? He's like, yeah, they are. They're speaking Italian. I was yeah. like, uh, okay. I <laughs> noticed that in the beginning parts of the movie. I was like, oh, it's dubbed. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Not if you watch the Italian version, then there's only a few characters that are dubbed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like that that concept just doesn't make sense to me like nowadays because i'm like why not just do it one way or the other i mean obviously you have clint eastwood who's american it was cheaper but it's like well this is in the 60s they wanted to because you could pay italian actors a mass a appeal lot less. right they yeah, wanted it to be a too. hit movie and they're not going to do that if you show an italian movie with no english there's a Although i think it had some some english natively yeah it looked like a, some people were talking english there's a ton of people um, that speak Italian in this movie, but there's also a ton that speak Spanish. And uh, a fun fact, Sergio Leone, he didn't speak English, so he had no way to really communicate with Clint Eastwood, but he did speak French with Eli Wallach, so they were able to sort of communicate that way. Yeah, Eli Wallach That's couldn't funny. speak Italian. Leone couldn't speak English, so they found a common language in French. Sounds like soccer teams today. <laughs> oh wait you're dutch but we're oh uh, okay so you know spanish all right sounds good all right there we go <laughs> no 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 we need the midfielder the midfielder needs to come up and translate for us <laughs> <laughs> yeah this i mean that just seems so wild i don't know i mean i don't know everything i've worked on everyone speaks english so it's been fine but yeah, that would just be crazy. It's like yeah, imagine a language difference. Half the people the don't understand what the director is saying. They're like, what do you want? <laughs> gusto, gusto. <laughs> what? What do you want? But you're able to get a three-hour movie done. It's like it's pretty cool. Yeah, seriously. That that you have the number nine best movie ever, <laughs> and couldn't talk to half the with two the two barriers if you know yeah. if not more of language and clint eastwood does not like this movie by the way clint eastwood has come out and said he's not a what? he's not a, a big fan of this movie because he thinks the only character that gets like story development or character development is tuco that's i can see that i guess yeah. i guess yeah i mean he is the man with no name that's kind of his so role if we don't even mysterious. get your name how are we gonna get your backstory, backstory i feel like yeah and Lee Van Cleef was in the movie prior to this, I think a few dollars more, but he kind of plays a different yeah. character. Yeah, he's a different, he's not Angel Eyes. He's he plays a colonel. Else. Yeah. Any memorable lines from the film? Mine is actually, mine is, uh, it's two lines that, that take place at opposite ends of the film, but it's Eli Wallach who says to Blondie, uh, I don't remember exactly, but it's something like there's two types of people in this world the ones that do the shooting and the other ones with the rope around their neck. And then at the end of the movie in the graveyard, when Blondie kind of retorts back, there's two types of people in this world, those with loaded guns and those who dig. So get digging. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I liked uh, when they're sitting by the river and he, after Clint Eastwood shoots the one guy and he's counting everybody out. He's like, one, two, three, six, the perfect number. And uh, Angel Eyes is like, isn't three the perfect number? Yeah, but I got six bullets left in my gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love Tuco's line when he shoots the guy in the bathtub, the guy from the beginning of the movie, <laughs> when they the three go in to capture him. And he's like, I finally learned how to shoot with my left hand. And he's like going on this giant like 
<laughs> here's here's how I'm going to shoot you. And then Tuka just shoots him a bunch. And he just gets up and goes, when you have to shoot, shoot. Don't talk. <laughs> Don't talk. I love that. <laughs> I loved the, uh, I guess he's like the saloon hotel owner. He's like telling somebody, he's like, oh, God, I can't wait till all the Southerners leave. He's like, they suck. He's like, the union will come in and they have, they don't have paper money. They have real money. They have gold. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then like the, the, the soldiers are marching by and he's like, yeah, go Dixie. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think this movie does a good job of being set in the middle of the Civil War without like glorifying any of it, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, it's a backdrop. It's just the setting. Yeah. It's not the story. And like, and honestly, like. With with the commander's speech for the union or the captain's speech for the union, and like honestly, they kind of show the southerners as losers like the whole time. Yeah, that guy, oh, yeah. that guy in the uh, fort, and he's like got all just like the eating corn cobs, and he's like throw them in the thing. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. you want infirmary? You got to go here. We're or not welcome to our five star hotel or whatever he says. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, I love that. He's throwing right, potatoes in the big cauldron. Basically, just yeah, basically just he's like he's like that. Our government just humbly paid for like. Yeah, Isn't so they, they, I think it does a good job of that of that being the setting because I feel like a lot of movies, maybe older movies, but I feel like some movies, especially more recently, have been shown to like kind of like glorify the Confederacy or that in that type of thing, and I don't think this one does that at all. Speaking of the Confederate cat or the the Union captain, his he has a pretty good monologue, but um, afterwards Blondie is looking at the situation of the Union and the Confederacy fighting over this bridge, and he's like. I've never seen such a waste of good men, or I've never seen so many good men wasted. I thought that was interesting, kind of that step away from either the confu- the Confederacy or the Union side, and it's like, this is just stupid. You guys are shooting each other over a bridge. Yeah. I liked uh, Tuco's. Um, I'm going to tell you something. When that rope starts to pull tight, you can feel the devil bite your ass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a great line. Just what a great line was there a surprise or a holy shit moment for anyone um there was sort of near the the first the end of the first third of the movie when blondie is captured then by tuco and he's about to like he's like oh put your put your neck through the rope and i'm gonna shoot the legs out of the bar stool and then that union cannon comes through and kind of saves the day and blondie's able to get away that was kind of a big shock when the camera pans to the empty noose i'd say the uh the first time you see that Blondie and Tuco are working together, Tuco's about to be hung and he shoots out the, the rope. You're kind of like, oh, oh, they're in cahoots. Yeah. yeah. Ah, this was all big, some big scheme. What about something uh, something that wasn't really big in like traditional Westerns and it's what made this movie kind of different is the torture scene between the bad and the ugly. Yeah, that was <laughs> Yeah, I, w- I was thinking about that too because you have like that with the montage of the band playing oh yeah that confederate like like, violinist oh he's in tears like you almost feel bad for the guy he's like i know i have to play this music to cover up the screams of all my soldiers being tortured yeah because like well that's that i didn't even pick that up until the guy says something to blondie he's like you know we've all experienced like like some time in there or something like like, something like that i'm like holy smoke so this is obviously something that they just (laughs) do like repeatedly because I knew, I mean, I, I obviously know like POW camps in the Civil War, like, no joke. Well, I think the the guy with gangrene in charge of the camp kind of is one of the things, and he's like, I can't wait till I can get the proof that what you guys are doing, because I'm sure he probably notices that like random times throughout the day, all of a sudden a bunch of music starts playing. <laughs> oh, this is weird. I wonder what that that sounded like a scream. No, oh no! Must have just been the clarinet. It was. It wasn't too big of a moment, but for me, one of the other times was when uh, Tuco and Blondie are. Um, it was after they leave the the mission or the the monastery, and you see the big like brigade of soldiers coming, and uh, you know, they assume that they're Confederate. Um, then the dude just slaps his arm, and the, all the dust comes off, and you realize they're, it's all Union. Not necessarily like a holy shit moment. Maybe more of like my favorite like line or scene um, at the end after the like shootout. Uh, Tuco walks back over and the noose is just hanging there and he like s- steps into frame and he's like framed by the noose and he's like, 
you've got to be joking. He's like, it's no joke. It's a rope to go. Okay, get in. <laughs> yeah. But, but then, like, gives him the four, and I was like, I was like, oh. I mean, I kind of knew the ending just based off of, like, pop culture. It's and such a popular it's, it's movie. Been, yeah, it's going to say it's been 60 years almost, 54 years, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was fully... I was there's part of me that was like he's just gonna leave Tuco there, and leave the four hundred the four bags of gold. I was like, oh man! But then Tuco's like yelling. He's like, Blondie, you know what you are? Just a dirty son of a bitch. And then Blondie comes back, and that takes a nice minute and a half. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't come back. He just turns and shoots. No, he's yeah, also he just that, like puts that, that he just puts that Winchester like on his freaking forearm and just sharp snipes the rope just easily, from, like easily. Like, I thought yards it would have been least. hilarious if he missed the rope and just shot him right in the head. <laughs> well, that, well, that was like, well, because <laughs> I was thinking that too, because I, I was I'm like earlier, eight. like Tuco had mentioned like, well, you better miss well, and I'm like, oh no, he's about to miss well. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, no, he's about to miss real well. God, what a different movie this would be if he accidentally shot Tuco in the head, <laughs> or if it wasn't accidentally, an accident. or if. <laughs> Yes. If somehow Tuco got shot in the head, I'm not saying who did it or how it happened, but if it happened, it would have been a different movie. Oh, but speaking of, again, I don't know that I'd say like, holy shit, but things that were kind of cool that happened also in the graveyard when after Blondie shoots Angel Eyes and he's like falling, he's fallen into the, like the little grave and he's walking towards Tuco, he shoots the hat and the hat like <laughs> blows up on top of him into the grave and then shoots the gun into the grave too. It's like, oh, what a baller move. Just like, so I like extra. also so that he cocky. was like, when he was like rescuing Tuco, he would shoot out the thing and then just shoot hats off people just for funsies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, just for shoot your hat off. I'll kill you. I could kill you if I wanted to, but I'm going to shoot your hat off. I'm just going to show you <laughs> that I could kill you if I wanted to. Don't even try it. I Don't have the high ground. That. <laughs> he literally does have the high ground. You won't survive. Don't even think that. <laughs> you were the chosen one. <laughs> you were supposed to bring uh, balance to the West, not destroy it. <laughs> God. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. How it works is every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. Audible has a free, easy-to-use app that allows you to download titles and listen offline at your convenience. Dylan and Ben, what are your experiences with Audible? So I used the Audible free trial a couple years ago, um, and I've gone back to it since. Uh, I listened to Pet Cemetery by Stephen King, and I really like it when I'm driving on like long road trips. I used it to listen to one of James Elroy's uh, L.A. quartet novels, The Big Nowhere. I would definitely recommend it to anyone on the go, uh, whether it's just driving to work or for long flights. It's great. You can, you know, listen to something on your phone, connect it to Bluetooth. You get to work, log into your work computer and listen up. To start your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash cocktails and classics, all lowercase. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash cocktails and classics. After your free trial is up, It'll cost fourteen ninety five per month. However, there are no commitments, and if you can't decide what to listen to at that particular month, that's okay. You can always roll your credits over for up to a year. A little bit of a tradition around here is Zach takes over and give us a trivia quiz. Zach, take it away. All right, so the first question we have. Uh, Clint Eastwood's salary was a hotly contested issue that delayed filming by several weeks during The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Ultimately, his agents were able to secure him $250,000, which was a massive salary at the time, plus 10% of the American profits, as well as a very nice sports car. What was the brand of the sports car? Oh, was my it God. A, a Porsche? B, a Ferrari, or C, a Lamborghini? I mean, it's got to be Italian, right? Are those all Italian? What were the cards you listed? What was the cards you listed? 
Uh, a Porsche, Porsche. I don't think is B Italian. Ferrari and C Lamborghini. I believe Porsche is owned by Volkswagen nowadays, which is a German company. I want to say that I don't know. I don't know if Lamborghinis are very sought after in the If 60s it helps at, at all, all three car companies were around when the movie came out. They were okay. They were around, but Lamborghini used to make like tractors and shit. That I don't know when they help, actually right? started making cool cars. Although they they made the Lamborghini Miura, which was a pretty cool car. I'm gonna say Ferrari. I'm also gonna say Ferrari. I'll say Porsche. Last but always least. Hey, I hosted this goddamn <laughs> quiz, you fuck. And you did a great job. Uh, I'm going to say Porsche. Well, somebody's right. Cam and Dylan are on the board. It was a Ferrari. What kind of Ferrari? I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question numero doso, which is how you say dos, which is Spanish for two in Italian. How many actors spoke English during the movie? Is it A, three? B, five, or C, seven? I think the answer is only three. So I'm going to say three. Because I, I tried to look for people who were who I could like recognize their lips as they were talking, and I feel like it was the three main actors. So I'm going to say three. I'll say five. I'm also going to go with five, because I think one <clears throat> other person... Did say something in English. Uh, I so. yeah. I also think I'm also thinking of one of a couple other people that I think. Yeah, I, I can think of five, but I I'm trying to in my head run through and see if I can think of any more. I'm I'm gonna say seven. You guys are in trouble. Dylan's in the lead. The answer was five. Uh-oh. There are five actors that speak English <clears throat> during this movie. Only five. Several thousand filmed. Five spoke English. That would be uh, Blondie Tuco and Angel Eyes, to Cam's credit. Yeah, I was right on those. The other two were oddballs. There was a one-armed Confederate soldier, and the sheriff at the beginning of the movie spoke English. Mm. Huh. Not see. the, uh, see, I was thinking it was the, the gun store owner. All right. When Blondie and Angel Eyes are traveling to the cemetery, Angel Eyes is counting up his body count, and he arrives at six. He says, six, ah, oh, perfect number. And Dylan brought up this quote earlier. What is the next perfect number after six? Oh, God. Perfect number is a mathematical term. If you... Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it actually fucking means. Thanks for the... Oh, sorry. Mul- multiple choice. Is it A, 9, B, 15, or C, 28? I'm trying to remember what the fuck makes it perfect. I had to look it up. I definitely had to look it up. Because I've heard of this before for sure. I just don't remember. I want to say nine. I don't know why, but 28 seems interesting. Like, that sounds right to me. Because nine and 15 seem too easy. I don't know. I'm going to say 28. We're going to see. Send it. Um, I, I'm going to go with 28. Cameron majored in math. He should be good at this. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say nine. I don't know. I also haven't taken a math class since I was a junior in high school. So it's Whoa. only been... Uh, it's been like eight years. So yeah, it's, I had to dig in the notebook for a Man. bit because... I'm the, at seven, Dylan. I feel your pain. The only time I heard the perfect number was in like introduction to mathematical proofs in college. And even then, it's kind of a bullshit thing. A perfect number is where the sum of the number's factors equal that number. Uh, and the answer is 28. Nice. Huh. So we have a tiebreaker. So Cameron like and one, Dylan tied two, at two points. One, two, four, seven, four, and 14. Gotcha. All right, ladies and gents, we have a two-way tie. Cam and Dylan going head-to-head into our tiebreaker question. We got a real stumper for you. This is going to be the traditional closest without going over format. So here we go. The price of gold in 1862 was $20.67 per ounce. How much would the $200,000 treasure of gold be worth today? Okay. Wait. So you said an ounce of gold is, was worth $20? Yep. In 1862, which is when the movie takes place, uh, an ounce of gold was going for $20.67. The treasure they were looking for in the graveyard was worth $200,000 in gold. How much would that same pile of gold be worth today? I don't know what the price of gold is today. 
<laughs> oh, silly boy. It's supposed to be a great investment. You're supposed to put all your money in gold. It's what, it's what Rush Limbaugh tells me to do. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, 18 million. My math's wow. probably way off. That's a so. lot. I'm going to go <laughs> yeah. with this more conservative thing and say 2 million and $1. So let me start by saying uh, Dylan was way closer, no, but, but he was yes. over. <laughs> in today's money, that two hundred thousand dollar pile of gold would be worth seventeen million five hundred and eighty one thousand thirty five dollars and thirty two cents. Round. How much down. is an ounce of gold worth today? Eighteen hundred and seventeen dollars. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's where I was way off. Oh, it's my favorite <laughs> scenario. Cameron, who has a podcast dedicated to him, not know a movie, wins the trivia for for the for the podcast. I love that's this. something you like to see. That's so dumb. I'm He's calling fucking, bullshit on that. The one. only reason he missed he, it by he missed it by fucking fifteen million. <laughs> fifteen and a half. Million. And the, yes. We're playing. And the, we're we're playing the the yeah, our off. rule, bitch. <laughs> the only reason he tied was a math question that had nothing to do with the movie whatsoever. <laughs> also, I Let's didn't know the also answer. put that out there. Before the movie, those of us who had seen it wrote down our ratings based off nostalgia and memory. And now I want to know if your rating has changed or not. Going into this movie, I had actually not seen all of it. I'd seen like a couple scenes of it, and I know I'd caught uh, more as I watched. I recognized, but I did not give it a before rating because I, I didn't feel like I had enough of a concept of the movie to really do so. Um, afterwards, I gave it an 8 out of 10. Um, I really like this movie. I know it's it's long, uh, but it's a nice kind of Western, but also feels kind of like an adventure movie to me. Um, you know, the, the long journey in that to find, you know, the, the treasure. Um, I love the long shots and the close-ups. I thought this movie was shot really well. Uh, the score is really good. I, I thought, you know... The acting for the for the time, I mean, what you would expect out of a, a Western movie shot in the 1960s was was good. Um, the ADR was a little rough, um, but again, it's hard to hold that against a movie that was done in the 1960s. You know, they obviously weren't as advanced at doing that kind of stuff as they can be now. Um, but yeah, overall. I really enjoyed the movie. I think if you're a fan of Westerns and you haven't seen it, you definitely should. Like Ben, I've never seen this movie before. I've seen parts, but I I enjoyed it. I think my major gripes are you could probably cut out 45 minutes of the movie and be fine. Do they need to be caught by the union twice? Probably not. Um I think the ADR is a little rough, but I don't think that detracts from it, especially once you like know that it's a different language. You can kind of like be okay with it and you don't really like the eyes don't really have to, or the mouth doesn't really have to match up with the words. I don't think, I think it definitely deserves its place. And I, I gave it an 8.5 out of 10, just everything from the acting to the score to the action, to the cinematography, and I was surprised the cinematographer didn't do that much more. Um, yeah, I thought it was good. <laughs> I've seen this movie a ton. Um, I actually grew up watching a ton, a ton of westerns, spending a lot of time with my great-grandparents. Basically, every weekend, there was always some sort of western on. And this one, as long as it is, was my favorite. Um, growing up, I before watching the movie, I gave it a 9 after watching the movie, I'm going to leave it there. It's a nine. Um, there's so much that this movie does well. The only thing I can knock it for, the ADR is not great, but for the time period, it's perfectly fine. And it is a little long, but it's never, it's never dull. It is sometimes slow, but it's not dull. It goes through a few different plot points, but there's something to take away from each point. And I don't know if you could remove it. I do like the idea of breaking it up into like a TV series. If somebody were to remake it, you could do that, make it a 10-part TV series. But I think the good, the bad, and the ugly, 
It is one of the two. I'll I'll make my podium stand. It's one of the two greatest westerns ever made. Uh, the other one being Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and I think it deserves a nine out of ten. So, like Zach, um, for my rating, also grew up watching a ton of westerns uh, from both of uh, both of my grandpas. I mean, they just loved like American westerns, Italian westerns. They had like cabinets full of just the VHSs, and uh, and so like you know the personal takeaway is obviously, you know, watching this is a lot of like childhood memories of watching uh these types of movies and, and you know just appreciating you know the, the cowboy like aspect and like you know the old west you know shootouts and stare and stare downs and stuff and just like the adventure of it um and watching it again i, I still get that like I, I do appreciate that um even though yeah it's a three-hour movie i don't i feel like there isn't there's not yeah there's not like a dull point it's almost like there's one giant plot with like these mini adventures leading up to that final big like climax of the movie. Um, and you know, I can appreciate a lot of like the acting work. Um, you know, even despite the ADR, like I totally understand it. Um, you know, I actually have not seen the Italian version of this, so I would actually be interested in like seeing that at some point. Um, but I can really appreciate you know, what this movie for what it is, you know, how it affects, and, and from a classic standpoint, how it really, like, inspired a lot of the other Western, um, shows, movies, video games, um, you know, up to this point, I know, like, you know, obviously the Red Dead series, um, super, super popular, and gets people back into this sort of genre, um, and makes it popular again, so I, I, th- I think it's, it's really timeless, I also give it a 9 out of 10. I have no nostalgia for these types of movies, zero like i didn't grow up watching them at all like not none of it and so like i don't have any of the nostalgia factor attached to this movie the only other western movie i think i've seen is the butch catch butch cassidy and the sundance kid i remember liking that movie but i honestly don't remember much about it um but i mean i saw it i don't know probably like eight years ago and that was the only time i've ever seen it so it was a long movie it was really long. I I don't think it was, like, bad. It's hard to place, but I just felt... I don't know. Maybe my expectations for movies are... Like, my expectation of the plot of a movie is, like, kind of high. Like, of, like, the stakes of a movie and, like, the plot and stuff like that. I'm not sure. Um, I just wasn't captured by the plot at all. Like, I, I don't... I didn't care that much about it. Like, I didn't find it that interesting... I I thought it was way too long. The the dialogue being on top of the, of of um being dubbed over wasn't too egregious to me. It was definitely noticeable, but I don't think that took away from it that much. Uh I will say though, I think the best part of this movie was the score. Like I think if nothing else, that score like has transcended time and like has been forever known and associated with cowboys and western plots and will be forever uh and so for those reasons i'm gonna give this movie like a six <laughs> no, 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 no. what does your heart say what does your heart yeah. say what is your actual rating don't don't do it like as, as soon as soon as the credits rating? came on what was your immediate thought because, to rate it because for a fact you were going to rate it lower and then you looked at there's all a side of the bet. cameras and went and went because <laughs> there's oh. a side bet Okay, okay. All right, all right. So, oh, no, I, I so mean, does I the think score... Does the score the right give now. the rating. movie enough to where you would actually watch okay, it again? Okay, okay. Let me, let me put it this way. When I, when I finished watching the movie, I was thinking about, like, probably a five or lower, a little bit. But in hearing you guys talk about it, I changed my mind a little bit. Like, before you gave your rating rating. Like, in talking about it more in depth. I influenced you one whole point worth? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's shocking. That's, up to the perfect so number you're supposed to write your or one of the perfect numbers start <laughs> well like i said like in my head i th- i thought of five but before we started doing ratings like you know there's other stuff and so i'll, I'll give it a six and yeah i just i have no nostalgia for western movies i don't know which might influence it, I feel like. I, like, I just didn't watch any, really. Yeah, western movies had their time, but I think for the bulk of it, 
I think you can take the the broad brush stroke. Western movies deserve like a three or a four because for 99% of it, they're all the same thing. But then you have movies like this. You have movies like Tombstone and Unforgiven. And you could probably pick one John Wayne movie. Um, Rio Bravo. Yeah, Rio Bravo. And there's like, there's some gems, but it's not full of gems. Right. But, 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 but you take the collective, you know, the collective inspiration from those gems and you see how much it's impacted since then. And even like remakes uh, of like some Western films, um, you know, like we, like we talked about earlier, like, like the remake of 310 to Yuma, um, for example, like, you know, the constant inspiration for that genre of, you know, of that concept, the concept of the old, the wild West. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's, I think it's, it's going to constantly be, uh, used for, you know, movies, TV, video games. It, it, it's always going to be that, that lore around it. Yeah. No, I yeah, can certainly like a romanticism appreciate... to it. Yeah. Yeah. I can certainly appreciate what this and other movies at, at the time have done for pop culture and, influencing other like red dead is one of my like favorite games of this generation like i think it's like a i think red dead redemption 2 is like a masterpiece of a video game like it is like one of the best games that they've like anyone's ever made like as an art form like not maybe not like from a replayability or like whatever but like as an art form i think it's one of the best games that's been ever made yeah but have you played men 2020 yet <laughs> <laughs> I have played Madden 20. <laughs> I was going to say the big thing with Westerns was the fact that you got to remember they were cheap, easy to make, and people went and saw them like crazy. Yep. So they were... It was easy I mean, money. It was like if comic book movies had a super low budget, it would be like how it is, where it's like, oh, every, every fucking year there's another 20 comic book movies coming out because they know they make money. Yeah, Marvel Only movies if- are our new version of Westerns just on a massive scale. Like we're going to spend a billion dollars on this movie, but we're going to make $10 billion from it. 50 to 60 years. People are going to look back at this time period and be like, Oh my God, I can't believe they made so many of those fucking movies. (laughs) There's like 45 (laughs) Marvel movies before 2010. And and I love, and I love it. I love all of it, but I know for a fact that it's going to, there's going to come a time where people are like, why the fuck? Why do they yeah, make be, so many of those movies? I'll be interested to see how they hold up. Because I feel like they try and incorporate a lot of elements into those movies. Like, they're action movies, but they're also kind of comedy movies. And, like, there's some suspense in there. And so I'm want, I'm curious how they're going to hold up in, like like you said, like 60 years. Like, the, the time difference between this movie and today, basically. Right. Or just people having the idea of, you know, knowing that it, it wasn't too much of a budget back then. And, you know, directors in production saying well okay let's apply a modern 21st century budget to this idea and and see what we get yeah i mean there have been a couple movies today that have been like that uh django unchained is kind of like this mm-hmm. movie i guess true i haven't grit. seen the color yeah, true true grit. Grit. um there was a netflix one with jeff daniels i highly recommend it i thought it was awesome it's called godless um awesome oh, awesome okay. western miniseries awesome awesome oh okay yeah, so I think people have done some interesting things with the genre um, since then. Cowboys but... versus aliens. <laughs> yep, that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am glad they set the genre down for 40 to 50 years, though. It needed some time to rest. They really milked the shit out of that cow. Right. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Check us out on Instagram at Cocktails and Classics Pod and use the hashtag Cocktails and Classics. Send us your drink and movie recommendations there. Share us with your friends, and as always, watch responsibly. Mm-hmm.